Well, I'm energized this morning. How about you? I, uh, um, you know, we, we, we said we're praying here, Brother Chris is praying, and, and uh, my wife put her arm around me, and then she leaned into me. That just does something for me. Uh, it just, I'm telling you, man, it, it's, it just makes like, yeah, that's right, I'm somebody, yeah. Uh, it, it, you know, if she can do that, what about God, our great Lord, and, and to be able to press into him? I mean, man, we need this time together. We, we, we desperately need this to, to get before him and... And this, uh, this title this week is Hide or Seek, and uh, we've, we've all played hide and seek. Um, I've mentioned before that I can't, there's just something in me, even just around the house, that if, if I hear somebody coming up the stairs, uh, and there's less people in the house now than used to be, so more often it's her than, than, than uh, anybody else now. But if I, if I hear that, I have to, like, I have to hide and I have to like try to scare. There's just something in me. Just this. It doesn't, doesn't go well. But I just. I don't, it doesn't matter. I just. It just. It, it makes. It makes me laugh every time. And, and uh, I don't know. This. This hide and seek is just. It's. It's in there. And you know, it's no different really than with the Lord. Many times, if you had to be honest with yourself, there's been times that you've hidden from the Lord. Uh, just things of your life and. The way then you participate in life is affected by that. And it's a direct result of hiding from, from the Lord and, and from God's presence in your life. And it becomes a common theme all too often. And it's not something that you think, well, in today's age, we hear all this. In today's age, and the way that life's being forced at us a thousand miles an hour, and um, it's, it's affected everything. I'm not saying that it hasn't because it has, but this has been going on since the beginning of time, this hiding. It began in Genesis chapter 3, verses 8 through 12. Verse 8, it says, And a man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord among the trees of the garden. Family number one. And they were hiding <laughs> from the Lord. Uh, so this theme is, is there for us. If you say you haven't at some point, you're kidding yourself because you have. And I just love the Lord's approach. Verse 9 says, But the Lord God called to a man, Where are you? As if he didn't know. Lord, he, he knows us well. He knows where we're at. He knows what we're going through. And even when we're hiding, he affords us the opportunity to come to him, to make strides his direction. He doesn't force himself upon us. He just asks the question, where are you? And he answered, I heard you in the garden. I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And the Lord said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? And he was like, Dang it, I knew you were going to ask me that. <laughs> I, knew, I, just, I knew that question was coming. Can you, can you, just, can you just imagine yourself in the garden. You, you've, you've done what you were supposed to do. You've eaten. From, you know, of all things, the Lord says, Have anything you want, but, but not that one. How many of you have watched small children deal with that? You give them, they'll, they'll just, just don't touch that. Have you, have you ever watched them with the corner of your eye or if you just say that and they just kind of walk by and don't touch that and they're, they're like, we're watching you and they just go. <laughs> what, what is it about the human condition where it's just, it's just we, we constantly are, are trying to get our own way. And he knew he was going to ask, have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? And look what happens. The man said, instead of saying yes, the very thing that we all do in, in relationships, I don't care if it's jobs, I don't care if it's children, I don't care if it's marriages, whatever it is, 
so often it's not our fault. There's some, something else involved. The blame game immediately starts to happen. Finger pointing starts to happen. I only respond this way because of how I'm responded to. I only react this way because of I. I only respond. And right away the excuses come. And look at the blame game. The man said, the woman, may I remind you, God, that you put me here with. She gave me some fruit of the tree and I ate it. <laughs> so I didn't just say yes. It's like, Lord, the woman you gave me is the reason why I did that. And, you know, it's so common in, in all of our lives. Right away, the blaming starts. We don't own up to just ourselves. And we're going to take some real time today to just stop and really face up to your moments, to face up to you, to face... We, it's, it's hard to do sometimes, but we have to get real with ourselves. We're real with everybody else. We already know what everybody else isn't doing, what they should be up to, and what the, you know, all of that is all involved all the time. That's one of my favorite stories of my brother when he was watching him in Christian fellowship, watching the kids cheat on the question that was asked. And he's standing next to, the, to Jim Vuklis, the leader, and just going, hey, Elbow, he's cheating, he's cheating, he's cheating, oh, she's cheating. Look, hey, do you see they're, they're cheating on this thing you told them to do? And just as calm as could be, Mr. Vuklis turns and says, it's always easy to see who used to cheat in school because they're very good at catching all the cheaters. <laughs> and so then Bill just stood there, didn't say another word with the rest. <laughs> ah, true, isn't it? We get so critical of everybody else, but we're, we're even better at catching people at things when it's been our deal. We know the tendencies, we know the ways, we know what it is. And instead of loving them, we get critical and finger pointing. And meanwhile, we're hiding to protect ourselves. It got real really fast, didn't it? Our moments. Our moments, I had to think about my moments often. I remember as a and working in early years of construction, I was worked in construction crews for the first 13 and a half of my working life, 13 and a half years. And we had to keep, we had to keep time cards. And on those time cards, it was all just, you, you'd fill in the times, the things that you had done, and the time that went with it. And you had to be desperately honest, or you could cheat and put times that you didn't really, that you didn't really work. And so what I'm saying is here is that there's, there's look, look at the moments of you and the Lord. We have to start practicing the presence of the Lord. When we're hiding from the Lord, we aren't practicing the presence of the Lord. So you get opportunities to practice his presence all the time. But we, we talk this game. We talk strong about the Lord is with me. Oh, he'll never forsake me. He's with me wherever I go. But if you started really practicing the presence of the Lord like he was really with you, would you still respond the same way and act the same way and do the same things? If Jesus was physically with you, would your life change? We talk of the this, of this supernatural thing of, the, of his presence, but then we act like he's not there. Truthfully. Because if he was really there, would you still act and respond in the same ways? Would I really add those extra minutes to the time card when I was in that spot? If Jesus was really there with me, and he's just looking at me. Watch what you're going to do. I would be to the letter. Oh, just every moment. Oh, I'm just so good at this, aren't I? I would let him know. Driving down the road, I'd be going to speed limit or maybe a little less because that's just, Jesus, this is how I normally drive all the time. It's just right there. I, I'm at minus speed limit. Oh, no blinker, no problem, sir. Just keep on going. I'm not even affected by that, Jesus. I just, that's just who I am. I'm, just, I'm a very calm person. Isn't it funny how fast you would change, the little things you would adjust? Really? Think about it, if he, was, if he was really there. How about the way that you eat? I, I can just picture myself with Jesus sitting at the table, I'm going in that second cheeseburger, not even paying attention to anybody else, and just, just putting it down. <laughs> and he looks, he's looking at you like, do you really need that much? I <laughs> No, no I, I just was seeing how you'd react. <laughs> You know, it's like every, everything would adjust. Who we hang out with, what we eat, what we drink, the jokes that we laugh at. If he was really there, I got news for you. He really is. <laughs> he, 
he is really there. And when you think of that, we, right away we get, we get humbled really fast at our dishonesty and our, our, our just our mess of life and how we respond and what we do and what we say and how we act and how we react. We have to give our moments to the Lord. We have to practice his presence because the hiding has got to end. And this is all part of it. First Peter 3.18 says, For Christ also suffered once for our sins, the righteous and the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive in the spirit. He loved us too much just to leave us in our condition. He paid the price so that it could all change and we could live victoriously for him. Here's the deal. We were trying to come up with a statement this week, and I, and I found it. I'll share it with you. It was about our sinfulness, sinfulness and who we are. And it's, it's this. It's sin will take you farther than you want to go, keep you longer than you want to stay, and cost you more than you want to pay. And isn't that true? You start dabbling in that, and it begins to take over. And as it takes over... You find yourself excusing things in your life or excusing yourself from situations or people. And that next thing you know, you, you're not really walking with the Lord every day. You just become distant. And you start to think of a time when you were closer to him than you are today, than you've backslidden. And we should be walking with him currently and, and gaining ground with him moment by moment by moment. And he loves us so much. Romans 5.8 says, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, he died for us. When you were, were not even wanting anything to do with him, you were, you were sinning and you were actively involved in it. He saw our condition and he loved us so much he died for us that we would have a way out through him. Not through any act of righteousness you can do by suddenly being good or doing something better. No, it's none of that. It's by giving Jesus that place in your life. Our hiding place is in God. That's what we have to learn. We just have to practice His presence. It's not staying away from Him. It's being shielded by Him. And we should practice that presence. Our, our normal is this. Our normal is, I would, but... I would, but my spouse, my, my wife. I would, but my, but my husband. I would, but my job doesn't allow it. I would, but the money is not enough. I would, but, and we have way too many big butts in our life. I would, but, well, I got news for you. Your big butt can't hide. You can't, you can't hide from God. Big Terry talked about this. I, I can run, but I can't hide. And yeah, you can't hide. You can't hide from God, but our our. our but all the time is leading the way. I would, but. You're familiar with it. You know what it is. It's different. We have that sentence that just built into us to be, able to, to be able to get ourselves free and clear our schedule to do the things that we want to do instead of the things that God would have us to do. You know what it is. But look at this one in Ephesians chapter 2, 4 through 10. How about this but? But God. We need to start exercising this in our life. When we come against the things that are going to trip us up or slow us down or get us uninvolved, we need to start answering this way to our life. I might continue in those ways that I used to walk in, but God. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. For by grace you've been saved, and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. It is not of your own doing. It is a gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one can boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works." which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. 
He has prepared a whole mess of things for you to do in life. He has gone ahead of you and prepared it and designed you for the moment and given it to you and entrusted you for it. So what is it? The Bible even talks about us being assigned guardian angels over our life to, to, to be assigned by God to see. The, and, what, and often the question is asked, so what is your guardian angel doing over you as you just go forward for the Lord? You're weak. You're, you're being relentless for Jesus and letting people know who he is. Is your guardian angel kind of look like this? Like, oh, here we go again. Here goes the weak. It's going to be all about them. They just want to call on the Lord every now and then for protection while they do what they want to do rather than this plan that God says, I prepared beforehand for you to do. And I've enabled you and I've equipped you and I've designed you for the moment. But you just you hide out in yourself, in your ways. Exercising the but God, but God provides, but God restores, but God heals, but God comforts, but God makes a way, but God forgives, but God saves. This could go on and on. All the excuses people would give you, you just keep saying, oh no, but God, you, you, you got to understand, you got to know who my God is. But are you spending time with him? Are you walking with him? Are you talking with him? Are you praying and, and, and putting the, the, the word of God to memory in your life that it could, they could actually defeat sin in your life so that it's there in your heart? And you're knowing who he is so when something comes up in your life that isn't him, it doesn't even sound right. Like that is, that doesn't, That's not my God. That's not who he is. Because his word have you hid in your heart that you might not sin against him. His word. Not somebody else's word or some design somebody else has spoken into you, but his word has spoken into your heart. 1 Corinthians 6, 15 through 17 says, Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? So then I take away the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? May it never be. Or do you not know that the one who joins himself to a prostitute is one with her body? For he says the two shall become one flesh. In verse 17, look at this. But the one who joins himself to the Lord is one spirit with him. So my question is, what have you joined yourself with? What does your life look like for the things that you've allowed it to become, that you have participated in, that you have allowed to, to lead the way ahead of Jesus? That you've made excuses to let them fit in because you just enjoy it so much? What are you joining with that is not of God? Because if he lives in us and his words will abide in us, they will thrive in us. And our ways won't be leading the way. We'll be trusting what the Lord has. It's a supernatural transformation that takes place. I heard a testimony yesterday of an 82-year-old man who didn't know Jesus. And somebody thanked me yesterday for giving the gospel again in a memorial service that we were in. Because you never know. And sometimes you, you, can get, you can get weary. Believe it or not, you can get weary. You give the gospel and you look for people to just respond to the gospel and just come to Jesus. And you're thinking, there's no way in a group this size that everybody here just automatically knows Jesus. And yet, you give the gospel and they just look at you like, is it time yet? Because we are, it's time for lunch. We've got to go. But in my mind, I'm thinking, yeah, but you need Jesus. So they thanked me for giving the gospel and said, I'm, I'm thanking you because my grandpa at 82 years old, it actually was her father at 82 years old, prayed to receive Jesus Christ. After all those years of just combating it, every time the, the message would come up, he just was up for debate. He had all the next question, the next reason why it wouldn't work, the next reason, just always up for debate. And finally, one of the grandsons said to him, Grandpa, I'm done arguing with you. I don't want to debate you anymore. He said, but let me just challenge you with this. Grandpa, I challenge you to just read the book of John for 30 days. Just read the book of John. Will you do that? And the grandpa said, you know what? I'll do it. 30 days, I'll read the book of John. She said, it was amazing what happened. He took the challenge, and he read John 3.16, working his way through it. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And at 82 years old, 
that man surrendered his life to Jesus. <laughs> we don't take it for granted. She says, here's, where, here's what even gets better. She says, my kids over the years had given, they, they would periodically go on, every other year they'd go on these missions trips to the school that they were in. And they'd always, Grandpa, will you help us out? And he would just say, no, I give to the church I go to. I know I give to the church I go to. No, I give to the church I go to. He wanted nothing to do with it. But you notice it was give to the church you go to. Just because you go to church doesn't make you a Christian. Doesn't make, doesn't, no, he didn't know Jesus. He went to church his whole life. But when he met him, it was alive and real. And at 82 years old, he found all his grandkids and says, I want to come to you and just say, I'm so sorry. I'm sorry for missing out on every opportunity to support you. Because I, he, goes, he told him, I didn't know. I didn't understand. I thought I had it right, but I didn't. I didn't know Jesus. And then he knew. So we got to get real like that. We have to let the Lord have that place in our life. He'd been hiding for all those years thinking he knew. And here's what Jeremiah 29 says. It says, Jeremiah 29, 12 through 14. This is, then you will call on me and you will come pray to me and I will listen to you. You will seek me when you find me, when you seek for me with all your heart. See, what's it going to be? Are you going to continue to hide or are you going to seek him? Because when you seek me with all your heart, you will find me. I'll be found by you, declares the Lord, and I'll bring you back from captivity. I'll gather you from all the nations and places where I banish you, declares the Lord, and I'll bring you back to the place from which I carried you into exile. He's a God that will bring us back to right standing with him, forgive you, put you in right standing, put your, put your plan in place that he's given you from the beginning of time, the ability to do it. He'll restore all those things. You may think too much time has passed, but how much impact did that man have at 82 by coming back and saying, I didn't know, but I'm telling you now that Jesus has saved me. That's impact. That's changing lives. Even at that age, changing lives. I come across a statement from R.A. Torrey. It came from this abiding in him and walking in him. I want to just share it with you. So if we are to obtain from God all that we ask from him, Christ's words must abide or continue in us. We must study his words, fairly devour his words, let them sink into our thoughts and into our hearts, keep them in our memory, obey them constantly in our life, let them shape and mold our daily life and our every act. That is walking with the Savior. Not just acting and reacting as if I were making all the plans for me, but taking the Lord and keeping Him in mind for what He would have me to do. It comes from this great piece of Scripture in Psalm 23, 1 through 4, with the Lord being your shepherd. And is He? Is He guiding your life? 1 through 4? Just look at this. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. I'll just stop there. Because so often our life is like that. It's like a, a shifting shadow and we find ourselves hanging in the shadows and... and Abiding in darkness many times. I remember with, with the kids when they were growing up and we had different times we have campfires behind the house and they always act like they weren't afraid of the dark. I'm not afraid of the dark. I'm not afraid of the dark. We had trails behind the house that were in this little woods that was back there. And so I said, you're not afraid of the dark? Then how about you take a walk? Take, take the trail. You take it every day. You've got to beat down from all of your bikes riding around it and going around it every day. It, just, it would go around. It would lead right back to the campfire, back down the hill through the trees and over here and come, come back out. I can just still see the shape of it in my mind, this trail. It was, just so, it was so wide open. And then I went up and I, I hit the switch and it turned the mercury light off. And it got dark. <laughs> and they're all together. I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid. I'm, well, then, go, then go walk it. Okay, we will. And down they go. I remember sitting there up there by this little fire was low, so it had a little bit of light, but still, and, and the leaves on the trees, you couldn't see back to it too good. And all of a sudden, I could hear, 
Dad? <laughs> I'm right here. Okay. Just keep going. Okay. And I just wait. Dad? <laughs> And over and over, I can spot them saying place to place until they come back and go, Dad, I told you we could do it. Yeah, about five, six times. Dad, we need the Lord, don't we? We need to call on Him. You're going to spot someone not understanding in darkness where you don't get it. You're going through times where you just, it's like, it's fearful. You can feel that fear. But the Savior is there. We need to call on Him and talk to Him and stay in contact. And he'll, I'm right here. I'm right here, buddy. Keep going. I'm right here. I didn't leave you. I'm still up here. I'm, here I am. He's right there, but we got to call on him. He's right there. He didn't abandon us. We need that picture in our mind to just stay in that place and not get so distant that we don't know it. We still have those times of fear. And I remember walking into a, I had my big German shepherd with me one time. And we, when I had my German shepherd with me, I wasn't afraid of nothing, I thought. Because that dog wasn't afraid of nothing. So then I didn't have to be afraid of nothing. And I went to a house. I was watching for the weekend. Some people had gone away, and I'm watching the house. And, and the, the, the lights had gone out for some I don't know why. When the lights go out, doesn't it kind of freak you out? What's going, why are all the lights out? What, did somebody just cut a line? All these things start going through your mind. Why are all the lights out? And, and the, the dog jumped out of the car. He didn't know. He took off in the dark, and he's pitch black. I couldn't see him. He, just, he left, but I knew he was there somewhere. So I went and checked the garage to make sure things was okay. And I opened the door. And I kid you not, when I opened the door... There was all these glass bottles that were on a shelf on the, the back wall. The timing was horrible because I opened the door for some reason, that shelf let loose. And glass bottles, just loud in that garage. And when, they, when they came down that wall, I went from just, and I was like, Jake! <laughs> just called that dog. And he, came, he came racing back and he got me next to my leg like, like what? What's the matter? What? He was just like, just on alert. You know, dogs, they, can't, they can smell, there's nothing there. And he was totally calm. And I was just like, and Mr. Big Macho Guy here just walked in, just, <laughs> look at my dog. And he settled me right down. But you're going to have moments when you're not going to understand. You're going to have moments when you fear, moments when it's just like you're going to feel like you're just on that roller coaster ride where you're just white knuckling it. But Lord, I need you. Not to be deceived. My dear brothers and sisters, every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. So we get caught in those shifting shadows like it's actually leading the way, and, it's, and, it's, and many times we let it just run our life like that. Every little thing that goes wrong, that shifting shadow just has us scrambling and chasing it and complaining about it and being frightened by it. And, and, and it's the next thing to talk about to everybody else. Would, would people even know you knew Jesus sometimes? Because all we talk about is the issue, the struggle, the problem, all that it is, just over and over reciting it. You know it so well. It's like, what are you reciting in your life? It's constantly the struggle, the problem, the issue, the whatever it is. That's what you're reciting. That's what you're going to get over and over. But if you start reciting who our great God is, he's faithful. He'll see me through. He did not fail me. He won't fail me yet. He's never failed me before. He's not going to start failing me now. His word says it's true. His promises are true. I'm going to stand on his word. I'm going to walk in that. I'm going to talk that way. And people will know that I'm trusting Jesus and not in the other things. Amen. So the shifting shadows have got to go. And when it's that way, I'll just say this. I'm going to just allude to it here in closing. In Acts chapter 5, I'll just read it. I'm going to read it. Acts 5, 12 through 16. The apostles performed many signs and wonders among the people, and all the believers used to meet together in Solomon's colonnade in the porch, or courtyard. And no one else dared to join them even though they were highly regarded by the people. See, this is not, you look at this, they're going hard after Jesus, but they live in a time where they're going to be persecuted for following Jesus. So they didn't dare join them in the porch, even though people were still were coming to Jesus. They, it wasn't just a, like this, it's okay to come in here, it's, and, and nobody's going to harm you for it, but there, there was some real animosity towards Christians. So they were hesitant about joining them, even though they were coming to Christ. Nevertheless, more and more men and women believed in the Lord and were added to their number. And as a result, people brought their sick into the streets and laid them on beds and mats so that, that at least P 
Peter's shadow might fall on some of them as they passed by. Crowds gathered also from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing their sick and those tormented by impure spirits, and all of them were healed. You notice how shadows and darkness often refer to the, the dark side. But the Lord is showing here that even with Peter's shadow, you know, I get in the light, and then you see the shadow on the floor here. Depending where I get on it, there'll be a shadow. Because wherever there's a shadow, there's got to be a light. But what's amazing is how God chose to use even things that were used to maybe throw you off. Things of, of, that people would relate to darkness. Where he says, no, I have power even over that. So much power that I'll take a shadow passing by. If my shadow was even touch those, they'll be healed as the shadow passed over them. Because our God is in control of everything. You think about that in Scripture. Spitting on somebody was a curse in that day. So if you went through the streets, you heard of it where they went through the streets and if they spit on you, they were, they were sending a curse your way. And when Jesus came, he healed the blind man, he put mud in his hand and he spit into the mud and he mixed it, touched the eyes, and he was healed, showing that I have power even over that which is cursed. I am God. I am in control. I am on the throne. These other things aren't ruling your life. Our great God is. He's in control. And I don't know where you've been in this, or if you've been seeking Him, or if you haven't been seeking Him, but He's the answer. He's the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through Him. 1 Corinthians 1, 27 and 29 says, But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise, God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of this world to despise things, the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before him. See, even things like a curse, the things that were made to nullify, the things that were made to, to be said to be shadows or darkness, I got power over it all. The minute you say that's in control, I'm going to show you that I have control over that. And the people I'm going to call alongside of me are going to be just regular folks. I'm not calling the very elite. I'm not calling the religious leaders. I'm calling people that, that they despise, the tax collectors and fishermen and people that have, have held in low regard. I'm going to make a heavenly announcement to the earth that, that Jesus has arrived and I'm going to tell it to shepherds, the lowlifes first. I'm going to let them know. This whole thing has been made for all of us. Jesus created us and said, this message is for mankind. Why do you allow yourself to slip into not believing or that you don't, measure up or you don't add up or your life doesn't matter. No, it matters. And God has a purpose for you. He's designed you for moments that you're not even stepping into because of fear and you're hiding out and you need to step out of the darkness, step into the light and let the Lord lead you in your life. Our hiding place is in God. And when he becomes our hiding place, he puts us into the light and says, here's my plan for you. Now walk in it. I don't know who this message is for. I know it was for me this week. For the times where I've stopped, the times that I've let my moments, the times I had to look at myself and go, Wow, if, if I really believe that Jesus was physically with me, how different would my life be? And if we're honest, we have some areas of our life to surrender. Some areas that have gotten out of control. Some areas that wouldn't be pleasing to God. Some things that we associate with. that almost gives our stamp of approval because we associate or participate. And, and the Bible says we're going to be held responsible for the act behind the deed. What are they up to? What, what are, what are, what's their purpose of the hearts behind that? And if I bind to that, 
I'm placing myself in a place of agreement with that, and, and, and I, I'm going to be held accountable for that. So God, take that from me. If there's doubt, then don't. And surrender it to the Lord and walk in His way. In a moment, we'll sing a closing song, and I have people that want to pray, and we'll gather. They're already gathering over here, and if the Lord's moved on your heart, I want you just to move. Just, just go to Him and say, that, just, just express the mess. He already knows it. And walk in that newness of life. There's nobody judging you in here today. We're going to stand before the Lord. And so we just, just go to Him. Just go to Him. So let me pray for you here. Lord, I thank you for this moment of time. And Lord, I surrender our moments to you in this place, the details of our life, the struggle, the sin, the mess, the selfishness, the words, Lord, of mouths and the thoughts, the things we participate in. Oh God, it's not pleasing to you. Lord, I pray that we'd be a people that are humbling ourselves before you. We aren't concerned what the person next to us thinks. Sometimes we're caught in that, Lord, where we're more worried about what people think than what you think. And I pray we lay that aside in this room and that we'd come to you today. Draw these, these men and women to you today, I pray, Lord. I thank you for the salvation you offer through Jesus for the one that's hanging on to that and wondering, Lord, that they would today would surrender their life to you. That they would pray, Lord, forgive me of my sins and come into my life and be my personal Savior. So, Lord, thank you for your presence. Give us power this week to walk in those ways that you've given us, the things that you've planned beforehand, the things that you've planned in advance for us to do, that we'd walk in those ways this week, Lord. We'd practice your presence in our life as we leave this place. And I pray that you be praised and lifted up and adored in Jesus' mighty name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.